Hi, I'm Brian Haberlin, and welcome to How to Make a Comic from Start to Finish. Uh, I've been doing comics since 1993. Um, I'll be using some of the image books that I do, like Faster Than Light, uh, The Marked, and Sonata. Ah, there we go. As uh, examples during this process. And we're going to do the whole thing soup to nuts, you know, as fast as I can go. And let's get on with it. Okay, let's get to it. So you want to do a comic. You got to start with an idea. And don't start with an idea that you think, oh, this is going to be a great idea. This is going to make me a million dollars. This is going to be super colossal. You know, if you're chasing the buck, then it's going to come through because it's just not going to be genuine. Uh, a comic is actually a lot of work, uh, surprisingly enough. It's really daunting to a beginning artist because uh, you're doing multiple uh, little illustrations on every single page. You know, it's not like you're doing just a single shot or anything like that. But you got to have an idea and an idea that intrigues you enough that you're going to want to work hard on it. Now, where do these ideas come from? You know, I recommend you having a little diary that you can keep by your bed because sometimes you get these ideas in the middle of the night. Uh, I tend to be a little attention deficit syndrome, so I'll hear something maybe uh, on the news or on a television show and, and hear it incorrectly, but that incorrect idea actually is something of interest. Um, sometimes ideas... Uh, People come to you to want to collaborate and they'll have the idea. Um, so you got to be open to that. You know, I always, when I start this off, if we we're in a live se session, I would have everybody who was a writer raise their hands and then everybody who was an artist raise their hands. And I'd say artists meet writers, writers meet artists. Um, uh, you know, I tend to do both. Um, in my career, I've, I've been an editor in chief. I've, co-created Witchblade, I've had Avalon comics with Wills Partesio where we did multiple books, um, uh, I drew Spawn, uh, I was editor-in-chief for Tom McFarlane, uh, so I did, I've had a long record in doing this kind of stuff, but again, starting from the beginning, an idea that intrigues you, okay? Um, David Hine, who I brought on board to work with, who I worked with uh, back in the Spawn days, uh, and he, he's, he's a great collaborator. So I basically told him, you know, I've got an idea, okay? And, and kind of where Sonata came from was, and if you want, you can check this out, this full blog post that David has here on waitingfortrade.com. Uh, um, but I've been first kind of started with just some images that were intriguing to me. I knew I wanted to do something that was grand in scale on this. I had just finished... <clears throat> faster and light which was pretty much a very straightforward uh, sci-fi series uh, but it was, it was also very realistic it was we get faster and light travel tomorrow you know um, uh, and it really was my excuse to do my Star Trek to a degree uh, but I wanted to do something <clears throat> bigger with Sonata um, so you know I've been playing with some of the ideas I started with some 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 imagery and I'll go through that because um, sometimes, sometimes it's the images that spur the writing, and sometimes it's the other way around. You know, um, uh, so you can see from this a big giant image, right? And then my initial idea was, you know, I really wanted to create a world with the kind of scope that Mobius used to do, and John Ford style vistas, and and flying machines, and giant monsters, and all that stuff. So I kind of had the idea, but then you need to make the story. You need to make a story with characters that people love and will come back for month after month, right? That's a real key. Uh, you know, I think even characters are almost more important than, uh, than story to a certain degree, though you need to have a good story as well. But if you're doing the 30th issue of a book and maybe you're getting a little tired of, of, of thinking intricate plot points and stuff. You have these characters that people are still going to pick up the book because they, they care about the characters. They want to know what's going on next. So anyway, Sonata started more from the visual standpoint uh, for me. Uh, so I started working on some character designs. I knew we were going to have these big giant colossal guys 
some little creatures. Started doing some character design. Sonata was going to be in the realm of sort of steampunk, that kind of idea. Um, and this is important as you're starting to flesh out characters. You know, you start thinking about what they're going to look like. You know, we have two different groups here, the, the, the Rans and the Taeans. But they didn't start that way. Um, you know, things evolve, and we'll get through, through to that as well. Uh, and you have to be open for changing as you are uh, developing these things, okay? Uh, again, as David points out here, the story is very nebulous at this stage, but I did know that I was going to have a female lead. And this is one of the earliest uh, images I did of Treen and Sonata, and they both changed to a, to a fairly large degree uh, in there. So anyway, so we're starting about with the writing, okay? So don't worry about spelling errors. Don't worry about anything like that. Just worry about getting words out on paper. You're throwing the clay down, okay? Um, like, for example, uh, if I look at Let's see what we got here. I mean, you'll see even the title changes a, a lot in Sonata. So get the idea, start working out the story and the characters. Um, you'll see, uh, as I pull this up, this is one of my first blops of Sonata on paper. And at that point, it was called Lost World. When I first originally thought of it, it was going to be called Flight. But Image already had a, uh, a collection of books that was coming out under that title, so I couldn't use Flight, which was what the flight, the one that I wanted. So anyway, another time, another place. Three worlds orbiting around a gas giant. Two worlds are inhabited by rival civilizations, the Rands. Uh, more spiritual, the Tans being more militaristic, and you'll see that originally they were the Tans, but it was a little too on the nose, the Rans and the Tans. Uh, so we changed this. That was actually a suggestion by Jim Valentino. Uh, the book comes out through Image Comics, through Shadowline, Jim's studio uh, at Image. Um, the third world is the Lost World. To both civilizations, this is with legends of their gods, uh, come from. This is where they, this is supposedly their homework. So they're both going there to co colonize it uh, and <clears throat> there's no easy way back. They, they have basically solar sail sort of technology and they can't hop back to their home world whenever problems arise. They have to wait for certain orbital windows so they're, they're stuck there. You know, I, I kind of thought when they get there, we'd have a certain amount of, uh, you know, sort of almost like the, the TV show Lost, where they're on this island and all of a sudden weird stuff starts happening. We have to kind of figure that out. But at its core, it's a Romeo and Juliet story. So we have these two rival civilizations, and of course we have a love story conflicting with those two civilizations, okay? And so this is like, you know, just basic stuff I put down, a little notes about the tech level, little notes about... You know, the Romeo and Juliet aspect, uh, started going characters' names. Sonata was originally Sal, and that changed as well. Uh, but that kind of all got incorporated into the title. Um, so <clears throat> how that moves along is you'll see in David's blog post, let me jump back up here. So more designs, trying to get a feel for this alien civilization and the different aliens, doing some character design. Uh, again, this is when I reached out to, to David Hine to, to, to be my wingman on this. So we co-write the book, I do the art, Jared Van Dyke does the color, uh, Francis Takanaga does the lettering and does a great job. Uh, everyone does a great job, um, but you'll see we go through here, and like this again, this is one of the very first bits that you just saw on that, that other thing as we talk about bits and bobs and throw it back, start throwing it back and forth. David lives in uh, London, um, so we just Skype back and forth. I'm on uh, the west coast of the United States, down California way. Um, so we go through, there's sketches and all sort of stuff here. Like I said, you can check out this blog post more in detail. 
So once I start getting this back to, to David and we start flushing out the characters, we flush out the, the different the, the, the basic story elements, uh, I remember very early on there was the whole, okay, we're going to do this book, couldn't use flight, so what's the friggin' title, so, as, Dave, as David wrote here? So we were bouncing back and forth all kinds of titles. Lost World, it was known as for a little while. Trinity, if you look at my main folder that I work on, on my computer that has all the issues in it, it's still called Flight, uh, even though that's not what it is. Uh, Trinity, God World, Sola, Solar, for a little bit, I think we were gonna go with Sola as her name. Um, uh, Sominus, Planet of the Gods, okay. <laughs> Sonata, but you can see they're all there. And then Sonata came out the window. Sonata was also a reference to Aria, which is one of the more successful creator-owned titles that I've ever, ever done. So we have Aria, now it's time for Sonata, right? Another musical reference. Um, okay, so um, we're working on the, 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 the story. We start throwing it back and forth with each other. You'll see, especially if you're working with a someone you're collaborating with, you'll see this is a, these are notes back to me, and it's still Sola at this point. So transition name, not quite Sonata yet. Um, and then David would, you know, we bounce back and forth questions like, okay, so you know. Where do the legends come from? You know, if they really are their gods, how does that work? You know, so you start, because what's interesting about this one is it's not like telling a story um, uh, like now in Los Angeles or New York or whatever. It's like, we have to make up the whole world and how it works. Um, and, 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 and what the boundaries are in that world and what the creations are in that world. So there's a lot more sort of um, uh, world building. Uh, so we did a lot of that and, I, and I, again that's that really does intrigue me. I mean there's, there's an elegance in finding a great contemporary story too um, but again I wanted this to be visually impactful so I really wanted to do some cool characters some cool beasties some cool world stuff right so again this is early on in the process David and I bouncing stories back and back and forth I recommend to you guys as you start your writing don't get cute with it off the bat start breaking down the characters you know Sonata what's her likes what's her what's her what's her dislikes um, another really important aspect to a character is you know think about some secret they have something something that they hide something that they don't because that, that, that that's real you know there, there are things that in all our in all our lives we don't face uh, and this is one of those uh, sort of things but every character should uh, should have that uh, to a certain degree so you're working on this what you have to do first is you're thinking of issues right so you're thinking about comic book issues. So usually a comic book story goes between 20 pages these days and can be all the way up to the, to, to 29 or, or 28 or depending on, on where you're going. I wanted to do more bang for the buck so all the Sonata stories and even the Mark stories are all over 24 pages um, and I feel that gives me a little bit more room to uh, to tell some core some 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 character bits in, in there. Um, once you start your first pass at it, so this is the basic story, right? Don't keep it to yourself, okay? And don't share it with your best buddy or, or your mom or the person who's going to be all, yeah, this is great, this is wonderful. You want someone who will rip your guts out, okay? <laughs> you want to find somebody who is the person who will tell you the truth, tell you, I don't get it, or that's not funny, or I, you know, whatever. Those are the people you want to find, okay? So I recommend when you're working on this kind of stuff, again, not to get cute, you want to think about going uh, very linear uh, with the stories to start, you know? So if you think of like, for example, classic story, Jack and Jill, okay? So at this point, you've already kind of set up who Jack is, what his backstory is, Jill, you know her backstory. You've 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 got that all set up. You know your story is Jack and Jill went up the hill, fetch a pillow of water. Jack 
fell down, broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. Okay. Now, once you have that down, so you have your story, you know what your story is. Now try and figure out what's the most interesting way to tell that story. Do I tell it linear, which is mean, meaning from start to finish. We're not doing flashbacks. We're not doing that kind of stuff. Um, is it more interesting to tell this story with, we have a, the opening scene is a close-up of, of Jack, blood coming from his head, and, and then going, oh my god, what happened? And then we reveal through the story what happened, and usually have some sort of twist in there as well. Um, or is this story better told from the perspective of the squirrel that lives in the tree above the well that's always hated Jack and Jill? Or is this actually a revenge story? I mean, look even in this picture, you know? It's like, yeah, Jill's helping out with the hand, one hand, but the other hand, you know, it's almost a fist, you know? Maybe maybe, maybe Jack's been, uh, been, been a naughty boy, and, uh, and, and, and that's how the whole tumbling kind of began. Um, so think of, here's my story, and then think, what's the most interesting way to tell my story, okay? Um, and when we're talking about comic books, we're talking about words and pictures, okay? So um, there really has to be a lot of thought involved in how you would tell the story stylistically. So, for example, this is a, 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 a page from Black Sad, which is a great book. Um, is your story better told with animals being the characters? You know, is your story better told? This is a classic Mobius, beautiful blueberry. You know, uh, what was what's interesting about this? If you guys are familiar with Mobius's work, is his blueberry style was completely different than his, I would say, his sci-fi style, which which I'll show you in the next. The next slide. So that's his, his sci-fi style. So really open uh, uh, lines, um, just simple but I mean elegant at the same time. Whereas Mo whereas Blueberry uh, had all this sort of uh, much more rendering, much more sort of guttural rendering. I guess I would even call it. Um, but it really fit. The story. So the important part of what I'm getting at here is you want to pick an art style that will match your story, complement your story, and make it unique in a way. You know, because again, your art style is like who you're casting in your movie. You know, this these are your actors. So these, these if people don't like these actors, you could have the best story in the world and it might still win out, but it might not. Um, so you know, again. Do we want to tell it in, in a manga format? Again, do we want to go more sort of children's book illustration with it, like beautiful mouse guard stuff? You know, if we want to go with one of the biggest graphic novels ever done, we have Mouse here, which was a story about the concentration camps and, and, and Nazi Germany, but it was with mice. But it was a, but it was a very serious subject matter, but I think by casting it this way, it had people take a look at it from another angle, okay? So really, really important that you decide on something, and and, when we, and you can even change your style. Like I, I did, you know, the marked a little differently than I did Sonata, you know, and I'm working on some new books now, and I'm probably going to, again, bend the style for that. The other question is too, when you're talking about sty stylistically stuff, it's like, you know, here's a, a couple pages from Walking Dead. Uh, does it need to be colored? Does it, does it, can, can, can black and white work? Sure it does work with, with Walking Dead. Can't, can't, can't argue with that. Again, Walking Dead, I think too, is a perfect example of what I was saying before. It's like these characters. It's like you want to keep reading Walking Dead because you care about these characters, you know, even if Robert has an off issue and nothing really happened, da, 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 but but you have your through line. You you know what happened to those characters in that period of time, you know, because uh, you care about them. So style is really important. Okay, um, 
if you're a writer, not an artist, uh, I recommend you know looking around uh, places like you know ArtStation, DeviantArt, trying to find places. There are groups and Facebook and different places of new artists and all that kind of stuff. They're out there, you know. Um, you have to do a little hunting around. Same thing goes a little more difficult for an artist to find a writer, I think, these days. But um, but that can work uh, similarly as well. You know, start reaching out to people saying, hey, I'm looking for someone to work with, and da-da-da-da. Um, or you can just do it all yourself. It's a lot of work to do by yourself. It's nice to have somebody to bounce things off of. It's nice when David and I are working, even if I hand them, here's the, here's the whole thing, you know, let's go. The back and forth can add those flavors that really make something interesting. Okay, so you got your story at this point. You got a script. Uh, scripts are basically there's Mar the old Marvel method was plot, just because I think they used to have to go very fast. But it was it was actually just also an old technique for doing it. So plot would be basically, you know, Stan would write, Daredevil comes into a room and Matt's angry and he has an argument with with such and such and he ends storming out. And you got two day you got two pages to, to do that, right? And then Stan would come in and write to the images. Okay. Um, the way it's mostly done now is so you have scripts that's still layout. Do, 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 do. Know, Lost World. That's the other one. And so you'll see here before you move on to actually having uh, jumping into full scripts for issues that we have a breakdown here um, of what the uh, individual parts are. So this is going to be a, we knew it was going to be a six issue arc. Okay, uh, which we actually combined the first issue into two, so it became five issues. Um, so, because I thought, again, it's something to think about when you're doing this stuff. I, I, a double sized first issue, if you can pull it off, I think is always good because it gives you more room to kind of grab people and get them hooked in, you know, rather than just 20 pages or 22 pages. Um, if it's around double size then you really can land a pretty substantial chunk of story uh, so anyway this is uh, our basic roadmap for the first six issues you know and you'll see even again another change uh, her name was Sana for a little bit too for Sonata um, so we go through these are the first six issues so we have kind of a roadmap and a roadmap is really important for you guys otherwise you can start going if you're going willy-nilly without knowing your beginning middle and end um, then you can get lost. Okay. Um, but as I was talking about before, though, when I was talking about plot versus script, here's a uh, full script for the marked uh, issue six. Um, so you'll see how it's broken down: page one, panel one. Okay. We have a description of what's going on in the scene, and then we have. Uh, description of what's going on in the scene and description of what so this is basically when we're talking about plot this is still plot but it's a very detailed plot because this is a plot that's been broken down to each panel so sometimes if David is in a rush when we're working on something or whatever and I need pages to start working on this is the fastest way to do it You'll notice though there's sometimes you put in like a little bit you know on a first pass maybe some some dialogue here or there or it can be full dialogue okay so it's very much like uh, a movie script or a TV script um, but the way you have to think about it is pages and panels okay and you have to be open to things changing so if you're a writer and you're working with an artist uh, see what they come back to you with you know and don't be super inflexible I was horrible when I first started uh, doing some writing at Top Cow. I remember Dave Finch was working and we were going to do Cyberforce at one point and David was interpreting pages in a way I didn't like them and I was like I'm just gonna script my script the way it was and and and, and, I, and I don't care you know uh, you'll find when you find someone who's really collaborative and are open to their ideas it's gonna get better okay so what I do as an artist at this point is I'll copy David's script into um, a page to start breaking down for layouts. So 
on Sonata. This was the basic first page. So we have a, lo a, a long shot of the gas giant and, and sun and another planet. And then we have a close-up shot of one of their solar sail vehicles coming into land. Um, I break it down this way by having the script in the layout is this way I can make sure that I have all the shots I need to tell the story. So this was again some basic plot from David here and I start breaking down my panels. And again, it, it doesn't have to be the best thing in the world. It's, it, it's, it's all about the start. It's about going forward, right? So you'll see that I'll have general concepts here. I need that shot. I want to have her putting on her, gla her goggles because she's going to go and, it's, and the, the, the weather is not so great and all that stuff. Again, the next page. And if you do pick up back issues of Sonata or the March, uh, they have augmented reality that actually show you my page layouts with the script, uh, black and white, two color, but we'll be covering that in this as well. So you see, start breaking down, make little notes. Note, use another scene for this. You have the guys coming out. Again, just making sure I have all the story beat, all the shots I need to tell the story. I'm not really, at this point, all that concerned about my actual page composition. Uh, the reason for why that is, is uh, I'm going to go very basic. This is Brian Haberlin's really quick page layout uh, um, process. So. What makes it really easy for, because when new artists jump in and start doing comic books, it's like, oh, where do I put a panel? Do I put a panel here? Do I put a panel there? And, and they end up getting very, like, cutie. Like, you'll get, you'll get someone doing a panel, uh, you page layout, something like, you know, okay, I'm going to have a, a panel up here like that, and then a panel going like this, and, and then, you know, and then, and then panel here, and like that, and, and this, you know, it's like, okay, but where do we go as we're reading? Do we go, is that what's happening, or am I going there, and then there, you know? Don't get cute, okay? Go ahead and keep it really, really basic. So my idea is basically panel units. So they're widescreen panels um, that you divide a page into. Um, so if a panel has five pages, you break it into five sections. And you make whichever the panel is, they're still going to be pretty much the same width. You make the, the ones that need some more stuff better, bigger. So like for example here, so we go boom. I did break this one because I wanted the sort of the, the animation motion of, okay, I get it, she's putting down her goggles. Um, and she didn't have them on, down before. Um, and then we have an open panel down here. But it's very clear storytelling. But what it also gets you is as an artist, you know that this is going to be your shape that you're going to be compositing in, you know? So you can move around those characters and crop them in a way that's the most interesting way and still conveying the details that you wanted from that. Uh, a print comic book is 6.625 by 10.187 trim size. If you're doing stuff for digital or just online, uh, that can be any size you really want, but I would always recommend that you do it at a high enough resolution that you could print it at some point, okay? Um, generally, a comic book page, uh, when you see like the original pages, and these are all digital, okay? Um, but let's say I did them on a board. Boards are generally 11 by 17, um, and when you scan them in, you want to scan them at least 400 DPI or higher. Uh, the reason for that is, Resolution is much more flexible downsizing than upsizing. So if you let's say you, you you hit gold and your comic is a big huge hit and people want to make posters out of some of the images you've done for covers or whatever, you want that resolution to be there 
so you don't have to redo the cover. Okay? But you see very clear, bonk, 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 bonk. Bonk, 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 bonk. You can give it a little bit of spice by breaking panels here and there. That's what I'm doing down here. Makes it a little more interesting. Again, kind of breaking it. Still keeping it very simple. I'm not doing the straight down thing here. Boom, boom, boom. But that was mostly because of the composition, because she's much more vertical there that I really couldn't get away with doing that shot as a, as a wide screen. But again, still very clear. Bump, 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 bump. And then boom. Oh my, it's a monster. Um, when again getting to basics okay um when you're starting to do your story and the layouts the other important part is not just what i was just showing you with the basic shots that's important that's really really important right it is probably is the most important basic thing right but the second thing you need to think about as a storyteller and which will make your work better than other people's work is think about the pagination especially if you're dealing with a print book but even if you're dealing with a digital book and you know which pages are going to flip you don't want to have, for example, so this is a uh, old fashioned light pagination. So covers, covers, and then each one of these pages that are together, if you take a comic and you open it flat in front of you, those are the two pages that you see, okay? So as you're going through this, this stuff, if you're gonna do a reveal, like all of a sudden we have a character, you know, on, on page six here, uh, and, and all of a sudden it has a big, they're looking at us like, oh my God, I just saw this thing and you do the reveal here. That's a blown reveal because if you're looking at this comic book open, you see the reveal, right? You want to have that character looking at the, oh my God, what is that thing? And you want to turn the page for the reveal. And then maybe it's a double page spread, but you can't put in double page spreads unless you know what your pagination is. Because all of a sudden you go like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do a double page spread from nine to 10. That doesn't work because you have to turn the page. So you're gonna get half your double page spread there, okay? This is what will get you, really help you with the timing of the story. Again, a very important thing for both writers and artists to know, you know? But artists, you better catch your writer if, he, if uh, if those things aren't landing in the right place, okay? Pagination, that's pagination, okay? All right, so we've got our idea, we've got our writing, we're breaking down the layout, we're starting on our black and white stuff. Um, if we go ahead and do, like, let's see, what's a good example? Do, 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 do. That's, all right. Another thing for people who are going to do print comics. This is a blue line. Okay. So you'll see bleed. Okay, and people don't know what that is. Okay. Trim. Trim is actually if you cut the sheet paper from the printing press, those are the edges of the paper that you see when you buy the comic. That's where it stops. Okay. And then there's an area called live area. Um, live area is within the trim and it's almost like a safety box. It's because, especially in older printing presses, things would move around, okay? And that's why there's a bleed at all. So if you had a full color background on something and the printing press shifts and you don't have enough bleed, you're going to get a white strip. And I'm sure you've seen it in some older comics or some even modern comics. Um, you're going to get a white strip, a gap. That appears so the bleed is to extend the art out beyond that so as things shift around as they can on a printing press you're covered it's essentially it okay um, if, if you were keeping all these panels within this live area and you just had white out here that's fine that that, that, that works fine um, um, but the live area is like your really conservative area that you know anything within this box is really, really, really going to get printed on the page. But I find these days that most of these digital presses are fairly darn accurate. And the trim is really kind of where I look more or less these days. I'll do a little bit to the side. The other thing you have to be careful of is if you decide that you're doing a graphic novel rather than a comic book, it has that spine 
So you have to be aware of the pages as they go into the spine and give yourself a little bit more room so they don't disappear, you know, as you're trying to open up that graphic novel, you'll know as you open up the graphic novel, there's going to be that curvature uh, and you don't want things to hide in that gutter. So that's something to be aware of. Most books, again, lay flat if you print them on really nice stuff, but if you print them cheaply, they're going to be a glued spine and they're not going to lay that flat. So you have to be careful uh, on trade. So let's say there was this page and another page here in here and the gutter, which is what it's called. Uh, between the two pages where the spine of the book would be. That's where you'd have to watch out and maybe move things a little bit more that way on that page and a little more that way on that page. Okay? Okay. All right. So we've got our page layout. We're starting to do our, our black and whites. Um, if you want to see the progression that we have here, uh, so we have our black and whites. So you'll see, like, again, that was a perfect example of we have here in the color, there's a big shadow looming over Sonata, and she's looking up. And then as you turn the page, you get, boom. Okay. So that's a pagination thing, storytelling breakdown thing. Um, for doing the digital art, uh, most people these days are using Photoshop, Clip Studio, uh, Procreate. Uh, a lot of people are working on their uh, on iPads these days with Apple Pencils too, uh, and doing beautiful work that way. Um, uh, or you again could still be doing it by hand. The trick by doing it by hand is you got to make sure you scan it, like I said before, and scan it at a good resolution. And do not scan it with automatic settings in place. You want to scan even if it's black and white. You want to scan it in RGB, full color, and then you because that will give you more data. Okay, because you want the more data, because you want to make the decisions on whether it needs to be lighter, darker, or, or sharper, or whatever. And by having a, a color at one point, you have, you know, 24 bits as opposed to, to 8, you know. Um, so, anyway, so that's, that's a little bit on the side there. Uh, also, you guys, if you need to fill in, I've made all my archives on digital art tutorials free. Huge Trevor Trojan and stuff. So you can go in there and pick out all kinds of stuff. There's a comic book production there as well. Anything I'm glossing over here, go grab them for free, yeah, you know, and check them out. Um, okay, so black and white. This is going to be a color comic. Um, generally, black and white comics do not sell as well as color comics. Some do, like Walking Dead is a perfect example. But Walking Dead also, I think, worked because it had the tones at least. So it kind of almost fooled you into thinking, oh, it is colored, you know? Um, but to see how these guys look in color, so there you go. Really wanted to do cinematic environments, you know? stuff floating around this is one of our gods lightning coming in little character moments this is colored in photoshop jared van dyke does the uh colors and then i'll get it back for a little pass over the top you'll see how they really kind of take shape um, with the color. I mean, I've, I started my career in comics as a colorist, so I was always the guy hooking up the, the guys doing the black and white, so I know kind of where I would put color and in other places where I wouldn't put color. Because um, I know, well, not color, I mean lines, because I know that it's going to be done better in color. And again, very straightforward. Boom, boom, boom. Storytelling, again, breaking the panels. If you're going to do this style of page layout, breaking a panel here and there is important because otherwise it does get a little, it can get a little boring. But it really is based on you doing interesting compositions within those panel shapes, which again is very freeing for an artist. Because if they just have to worry about making that shape and what's in it the most interesting thing they can. That's great. Uh, you'll notice also another note for artists here. 
try not to always have something centered in the middle of a page i'm going to open this up in photoshop real quick all right so and this is a great todd mcfarlane lesson um, basically what we have here is every page is a big rectangle right so what you want to do to make interest in your layouts is you don't want to have things matching those lines and again we have then panels more rectangles right but notice how i don't have her like centered right and notice how i have her turned to the side which is more interesting okay you want to try to avoid you know the whole page being bink 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 everything centered you know when things get off to the side they're more interesting and also notice again trying to do some different angles with this so you don't want to have a character for example that's sitting here you know I'll do here in the middle sitting here and just straight on at us that's boring you know move the camera around you know so it's like that same character and now we're going to look at that character from above right is the angle okay so move this and do you know you know big shots move the camera in camera out you know so it's just now there's a big shot of sonata's eye and you got plenty of room here for for writing and stuff like that if i jump back to uh Here you'll see, you know, boom. Again, moving the camera in, camera out. Generally, uh, beginning a beginning uh, comic artist will keep everything at eye level and keep characters all the same same sizes on a page. Move in and out, change the angle, change the sizes. Okay, think more like a cinematographer and a director. Okay. To see very few things that are straight on. And when you're deciding again, when something's impactful, like, you know, like this shot, for example, that reveal, that's a whole page, splash page. Okay. And if it was if I really wanted to do more, make it a double page splash, really impactful. So that size is what's going to get you the <gasps> moments in your book. So don't forget about that either, okay? Okay, so we've got the writing done, but we don't. And I'll tell you why in a second. We've got the art done based on that writing that was done. But now is the time for the writer and maybe the writer and the artist to go over the script together because I guarantee you that whatever the artist did is not going to be exactly what the the writer thought it was going to be so you'll say oh yeah you know he looks a little snarky here he should say something a little more snarky you know than what the line I had before or or he can comment now on her robot hand you know I didn't realize you were going to have the robot hand in the in the in the panel you know so, so for a comic to really be good it needs another writing pass after all the art is done okay okay all right so we got the writing done we got the script done now we got to letter it this is worth the whole panel thing right here guys i hate lettering this little 29.99 program this is comic life okay this is this most the easiest quickest way to do lettering that I've ever found. So let's go ahead and grab something. Oops. Leave your words here. Great script right there. You can move around the balloon. You can grab the tail, stick it wherever you want to. Uh, cadence is really important when you're dealing with uh, writing in a comic book. So, you know, you have a lot of linked balloons. This will enable you to do the linked balloons and move them wherever you want to. You can rescale the balloons as well, make them bigger. That can have an impact as well. You know, when you have a huge balloon with just a couple words in it, like, oh no, you know, 
think about that as well because it's it's yeah. words and pictures but it, the words themselves when a comic book can also be a picture if you know what I mean move that around again I could add another linked balloon if I wanted to you could do a burst you know again I can move around that tail super easy you know it's got captions it has effects so you know take them rotate them around over here you'll see they have a bunch of different styles same thing goes for those balloons as well this is worth the price guys lettering yay lettering again something i hate to do uh, normally it's done in in in, in illustrator uh, francis does it in illustrator if i had to do it all by myself this is where i would do it okay very fast very 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 easy very quick uh, again like if we look back here you'll see over here too there's also styles for the balloons there's the stroke i can make i can make larger you know like if i wanted that to be three also now i so you have a lot of control here um uh, so highly recommend this for lettering um if you're going to print things have to be converted to cmyk again i have free on my site because it goes into deeper stuff comic book production you can download that and check it out it will talk about cmyk conversions which is something that if you're going to go to real print you need to know that stuff and I don't have enough time to cover it during this seminar, uh, but it's all there. Download it for free, digitalarttutorials.com, um, and uh, and you're done. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so you've lettered it, you put it together. It's in a digital form. Now you need to kind of like, oh, you know, put a cover on the thing. Yeah, do a cool cover, right? You know, um, couple important things about the cover is again this is something that i learned via experience you know um you want to make sure that it's readable you want to make sure that not just it is readable but you want to make sure that let's see where is we got it here you have a readable logo now think about how most comic books are racked sometimes so there'll be another comic maybe in front of it starting with right about here right so you want to have your logo up here and you want to have it so it can be clearly read from across the room don't get super fancy with all these bevels and stuff like that that people can't read whatever your name or your title is because then they won't know how to ask for it and they won't know how to put it into a Facebook group saying how cool it is or Instagram or Twitter or whatever um, keep it simple stupid okay <laughs> keep it very simple now Jim Altino likes to put in the the logos and the cover treatments on on these covers uh, and it's kind of funny because he'll actually break a certain amount of these rules um, so like for example now this is not on a first issue on a first issue you want to make sure like that one I just showed you is super readable this is not as readable okay normally I probably would not have done that logo treatment okay that's readable that's clear very clear again clear but again this is not something you would do on a first cover you know you want people to know the book by the time you start messing around with where you're putting, placing your logo that works that works well that works gets a little light I probably would do some sort of stroke around that again this gets a little mm, for me uh, I'd rather have had that be pure white and again readability 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 same thing here this was a first issue and this did a great big bozo no no and the big big bozo no no is the logos down here at the bottom 
it does look cool at the end of the day but really if it was up here it probably would make the difference in some sales readable 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 clear readable clear readable and interesting you know things on the cover your cover is your your sales poster okay you know, if you can't pull them in with a cover poof it's going to be hard for you to go beyond that And sometimes the, the the cover doesn't have to be exactly what's going on as long as it's a you know think of it like a movie poster it doesn't have to be exactly what's going on in that issue with the book it just needs to be a cool representation of your characters this was actually done by uh jana clato who i've worked with before who was my aria artist back in the day and athena inc jay did these two uh on sonata we do do two covers which is uh, we usually do a monstrous one like something like that and then something that's a little bit more more pin up pin up -y, like that beauty and and the beast essentially and that does give you an opportunity to get some more stuff out okay so we got our cover done we got we got it we got it all set for print we're gonna make a PDF again that detail is gonna be uh, check out digital art tutorials my production secrets uh, tutorial there and we'll go th you'll go through all that stuff make a PDF uh, get it out to the world do you want someone to see it right uh, I mean you're not gonna be going waltzing in an image comic books people think oh I can go in there with just a pitch or something like that and you've never done a comic book before unless you're a big movie star or something like that that's probably not gonna happen um, so what you need to do is have a full book and a full book that then you present to them this is it this is what's gonna look like you like it let's go let's let's publish it right now we need to talk about the business of this stuff so let's say you're just doing this I mean because there's also a variety of ways to do this there's also Kickstarter Indiegogo all these places that you can raise money to do these yourself and really I think that the direct-to-consumer thing is kind of where things seem to be heading these days more and more but that means you need to have a presence and a fan base that means you need to do social media <laughs> um, and it's gonna take work and what you need to do before you start doing it is have stuff in the pipeline like you saw for example the uh, the the blog posts that David did this is a great way to do some social media people can get behind the the, the 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 what's going on how the book was made you know talking about different secrets about you know layouts and all that kind of stuff post it somewhere post it like a diary post whatever but but make sure you do weeks of it before you ever po post the first one because there can be times when you just don't feel like posting but this way it's all set up and then you can just do it you know and you don't lose followers and traction that way um you think about little promo tchotchke things you can do i mean you used to be able to go to comic book conventions and of course this year that kind of got blown but um hopefully that will all be back again you know get a table of the comic book shorts be there smiling standing behind your comic don't 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 get a table that you're showing your new cool comic book and you're sitting behind it looking at your phone stand up engage with people you know get out there you know do all that kind of stuff I mean have promo stuff ready you know like for faster and light uh, I did for these little you know envelopes that I printed myself had a little letter that would go out to um, to retailers uh, you know engage retailers especially if you're gonna be doing a print book you know uh, and I sent them out a free first issue a little patch that I made for the faster and light and uh, and they did a, a sketch cover okay um, again for promo items uh, you know we did these these really nice patches that we got out to people and people really like those um, you can do this is for another project uh, called between worlds which was actually a uh, il illustrated novel that we did for random house and we did these little gold plated versions I can 3d sculpt and 3d print and know how to do all that stuff so I could have these super fancy for really people you really want to impress because these were not cheap to do you have to weigh is that worthwhile um, we did fashion and light these little I I, I I found them on a on a on a, on a site they were like probably 50 cents each they're little stress astronauts and, 
and probably cost us a buck each to do maybe and that's a fashion light logo behind it and send those out as well you know so you got to be ready to like promote the heck out of these things okay and do you know your own little you know recordings of you working and, and doing all that kind of stuff um, uh, again, if we're going digital, there's a whole bunch of different places out there uh, for you can try and go straight digital with. Uh, and a lot of them have beginning artist stuff uh, as well, so that's not a bad place to go. Set up your own page, do your own web comic. Just get it out there. Don't be shy about getting it. Make people see it, you know? Um, again, uh, Digital art tutorials. I've got all my stuff free, free there. My current books that are out are Sonata, The Marked. Uh, there's some new books coming out. Um, both Sonata and Marked are both in development at great places for television shows right now, which hopefully that will happen. Knock on wood. That's also the benefit of you doing your own comic as opposed to working on some of Stan and Jack's characters. Um, you own it. You can do whatever you want with it, uh, and it's a lot of fun. So. Uh, thank you guys for coming to Virtual Comic Con, um, and uh, I'll put up a little card to show you where you can reach me on my social and stuff, and when I ask me some questions directly and, and that kind of stuff, but I post new little short tutorials all the time and stuff. Anyway, thanks guys.